You know, in today's markets, things move so fast. It really feels like you're trying to catch smoke sometimes. One minute things look okay, the next, bam, turmoil hits. And you're left scratching your head wondering why things moved the way they did. We've all felt those recent jitters, haven't we? Where just watching, say, the S&P 500 doesn't quite tell the whole story. Definitely. It often feels like you need more context than just one index. Exactly. Which brings us to today's deep dive. We're looking into something pretty fascinating, short-term correlated stress reversal trading. Now, this isn't your standard approach of just watching one stock. It's a much more sophisticated way of reading the market's signals. It looks at how different types of assets, you know, equities, commodities, bonds, how they all move together, especially when the market's under real stress. Mm -hmm. So our mission today, we want to unpack this strategy, really get into how it looks beyond the obvious stuff. It uses signals from multiple asset classes, sometimes ones you wouldn't think are related to spot these, like unique short-term chances. We'll dig into the theory behind it, the nuts and bolts of how it works, and crucially, what the actual results show. Yeah, and the goal here is really to give you a shortcut, a way to quickly grasp how these seemingly separate market moves can actually offer really powerful insights. You'll hopefully see how understanding these connections isn't just academic theory, it's, well, it could be a practical tool for spotting those quick market hiccups, those reversals that you might otherwise miss completely if you're just looking at one thing. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Okay, let's unpack that. Usually when we think market stress, our eyes go straight to like the S&P 500 dropping. Right, that's the common reflex. But this research is basically saying, hold on, look wider. Why is that? Why broaden the view? Are those single drops just noise sometimes? That's a really key point. Because look, if only the SPY, the S&P 500 ETF, takes a dive, well, that could just be down to some company-specific news, right? Yeah, or maybe yeah. a sector issue, or even just some technical trading thing. It doesn't automatically tell you about the whole market's mood. So yeah, in that sense, it could just be noise. The core idea is about concurrent declines. So multiple risky assets falling at the same time. I think equities like SPY and maybe commodities like USO for oil or even GLD for gold, mm -hmm. when you see those dropping together, and this is crucial, you also see a rally in the typical safe havens, like U.S. Treasuries, represented by IEF. Okay, so it's the combination. Exactly. That specific pattern. It screams flight to safety. It suggests everyone's rushing for the exits at once. Maybe it's a temporary liquidity shock. Suddenly everyone wants cash. Or just a big wave of risk aversion washing over the market. It points towards, you know, systemic stress. Or you could call it correlated de-risking. Basically, big players are pulling back risk across the board, not just in one little corner. Right, not just selling tech stocks, but selling lots of things. Precisely. And what this multi-asset confirmation strongly suggests is that the market is probably, well, overdone it in the short term. It's like a collective panic selling, you know. It goes beyond the fundamentals of any single asset. And that kind of broad overreaction, that sets up a much stronger case for mean reversion strategies. The idea that prices will snap back towards their average. So this strategy is fundamentally about being the one who steps in, provides liquidity. When everyone else is, frankly, panicking a bit too much, you buy into that temporary dislocation. That makes a lot of sense. It's not just one bad day for Apple. It's like the whole financial weather system has shifted abruptly. That synchronized move is the real signal. Exactly. It tells you something deeper is happening, system-wide. So does this imply it's always just a short-term blip? Or could this pattern sometimes signal something worse that doesn't bounce back quickly? That's a fair question. The strategy is specifically designed to target these short-term dislocations. The underlying assumption is that these correlated events often stem from temporary imbalances, like a sudden dash for cash, or just pure sentiment, rather than a lasting change in the economic outlook. Now look, no strategy is ever guaranteed, right? But the idea is that the multi-asset confirmation makes the signal more robust. It increases the odds that the market has overreacted just in the very short term, creating that potential for a quick rebound. Okay, understood. 
So we've got the why, this idea of a market-wide overreaction confirmed across different asset types. But, you know, for anyone listening, the practical bit is the how. How did the researchers actually turn this into something you could, well, trade? What specific assets did they track, and how did they define one of these stress events precisely? Right. The methodology is critical here. They looked at five main asset classes using common ETFs as proxies. These are just liquid ways to track broad market segments. So for equities, they used SPY, the S&P 500 tracker. For commodities, USO for oil, precious metals. That was GLD, the gold ETF. Then for fixed income, the key risk-off asset, they use IEF, which tracks intermediate-term U.S. Treasuries. Okay, the safe haven. Exactly. And finally, currencies, using UUP for a bullish U.S. dollar view, although that turned out to be less central to the main results they found. And the data they used is pretty solid. It goes back to 2004 for some, 2006 for others, all the way up to 2025. So nearly two decades of data. Wow. Now, for identifying the stress event, they use something called a dynamic threshold model. Think of it like a smart sensor. It's not just a fixed line in the sand. It's flexible. It can spot stress even if the moves aren't, you know, earth-shattering. It defines a stress event in basically two ways. First, a simultaneous one-day drop in two risk-on assets. So maybe gold and equities both fall, or oil and equities, or oil and they gold. Two risky things down. Or second scenario, a one-day drop in one risk-on asset combined with a rise in the risk-off asset. So like U.S. Treasuries, IEF, go up while gold GLD goes down, yeah. or Treasuries up, equities SPY down, or treasures up, oil USO down. Right. The classic flight to safety move paired with specific weakness. Precisely. And the threshold part is key. It's adjustable. How big do these moves need to be? For example, they tested a 1% threshold. That means maybe both risky assets fall more than 1%, or risky one falls more than 1%, and the safe one rises more than 1%. But what's really insightful is they found the optimal thresholds were often much smaller like between 0% and negative 0.5% for the risky assets falling, and 0% to plus 0.5% for the safe haven rising. Really? That's small. Yeah. It suggests you don't need a huge market crash. It's the correlation, the fact that they're moving together in that specific way, even with relatively small moves, that carries the signal. It's quite subtle. That is fascinating. It's about the pattern, not just the size of the panic. Okay, so we know what triggers the signal. Now, the big question everyone's probably thinking, once you get that signal, what's the actual trade? What do you do? It's actually, well, surprisingly straightforward. The strategy is designed to be very short term. It's a one day trading strategy. You initiate the position, go long. At the close of the day, the stress signal occurs. Okay, end of stress day, you buy. And then you liquidate, sell at the close of the next trading day. So you're holding for just one day, quick in, quick out. The aim is to capture that immediate bounce back, that snap back after the presumed overreaction. They looked at potentially going long on oil, treasuries, gold, equities, or the U.S. dollar. But for the core reversal play, the real focus ended up being on equities, specifically SPY. That seemed to be where the rebound was most consistent. Right. So theory sounds good. Setup seems clear. But did it actually work? When they ran the numbers across almost 20 years of market history, what did they find? Did this cross-asset approach actually yeah, pay off? The results were definitely interesting, particularly for equities. And, well, here's the headline finding, really. They found that equity markets represented by the major S&P 500 index are performing best after short-term stress, which basically means they're an ideal asset on which to base correlated reversal strategies. So SPY was the place to be after these signals. That's what the data strongly suggested. When these multi-asset stress signals flashed, the S&P 500 tended to show the strongest and most consistent rebound on the following day. The research really makes a compelling case that that's where the short-term opportunity was concentrated. And they also confirmed that those optimal threshold ranges we talked about, the smaller, subtler moves, consistently perform best, which kind of validates the whole model. Okay, that's pretty clear. Equities bounce best. Yeah. So building on that, since SPY looked like the best thing to buy, and since there were multiple ways to trigger the signal, they thought, well, why not combine signals? Create a sort of composite strategy. Diversify the signals themselves. Exactly. Diversify the predictors. They specifically tested combining three different signals. All of them involved treasuries, IEF, going up that flight to safety sign while a risky asset went down. The three were IEF up, GLD, gold, down. Second, IEF up, USO, oil down. And third, IEF up, SPY, equities down. Okay, all using the treasury signal, but pairing it with stress in different risk assets. Precisely. The logic is, binding these, you're not betting on just one specific correlation, 
but on a broader confirmation of that market-wide stress and potential overreaction. It makes the overall entry signal potentially more robust. And what happened when they combined them? The result was pretty positive. This aggregated strategy demonstrated enhanced risk-adjusted returns. Meaning? Meaning it delivered better returns for the amount of risk involved compared to relying on just a single signal type. It smooths things out a bit, potentially. It really reinforces this idea that stepping in during these correlated stress moments, acting as that liquidity provider when others are maybe panicking, well, it could be advantageous. And if you look at the bigger picture, these findings really mesh well with other research out there that talks about the benefits of buying into short-term stress in volatile markets. That really does drive home the point, doesn't it? Combining signals, getting confirmation from different parts of the market just makes the whole approach stronger. It's like having multiple reliable sources confirm a story you feel much more confident. It's exactly. More data points, better picture. So wrapping this up, this deep dive has really shown how looking beyond just one index like the S&P and instead monitoring these correlated stress events across equities, commodities, bonds, how powerful that can be for spotting these fleeting market overreactions. It really underscores the maybe surprising resilience of U.S. equities and bouncing back from these specific kinds of system-wide jitters. And maybe it raises a question for you listening right now. If markets are this interconnected and these patterns pop up during stress, how might knowing this change how you read the financial news each day? Or even how you think about the connections within your own investments? It's not just isolated movements, is it? It's often an ecosystem reacting. That's a great point. So maybe the next time you see those headlines about market chaos, you might pause and wonder, is this just a localized shakeup? Or is it one of these broader correlated stress events signaling something quite unique, maybe even an opportunity for those reading the signs? 